Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 5th edition Vampire the Masquerade tabletop role-playing rules by World of Darkness. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. Listeners should know that this podcast is intended for a mature audience and will include strong language and mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and so forth, that may bear resemblance to entities living, dead, or undead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Rena Henze, and for tonight's game, I will be your storyteller. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Old Waves podcast, Vampire the Masquerade Chronicle, Shards of San Francisco. I'm your storyteller, Storytellerina, and tonight we are bringing you the further adventures of our coterie, if we can call them that anymore, as they venture about the different parts of the city. We'd like to thank all of our backers, our Patreon backers, for supporting us and giving your helps and hindrances to our hell spawn as they move through the nights of San Francisco. And thank you all for your listening ears. Before we get into our actual adventures for the night, however, we do need to have some introductions. So to my right. Hi, this is Mike, and I'll be playing Marcus Voss of Clan Bruja. And next to Mike. Hi, I'm John, and I'll be playing Vince Markovich of Clan Tremere. And next to Vince. Hi, my name is Tegan, and I'll be playing Rom the Shaman, Clan Malkavian. At the end of the table. Hi, this is Ali, and I play Katerina Bogdanovich of Clan Toreador. And next to Ali. Hello, hello, this is Bridget, and I am playing Monica West of Clan Salubri. Yes, you are indeed. And last, but certainly not least... This is Tiffany, and I play Alex Giovanni of Clan Hakata. So with our Hellspawn assembled, at least at the table, if not in actuality, we can begin. It is still the night of the 3rd, February. Fairly early on in the evening, it's only been about three and a half hours, so we're about close to 11 p.m. So we've had some interesting interactions, let's say, at Elysium barony and uh on a certain party boat out in the bay so let's jump right back in and see where the rest of the night takes us this cold dreary drizzly night so let us uh begin with alex alex you have completed your stint let's say at Elysium as Hikata in residence for the evening after having a very interesting and somewhat insulting message from William the Hammer. He knew what he was doing. You know that. He knows that. All of Elysium probably knows it at this point. But you can pack up and head out now that you have been seen and have been known to be seen. What are your plans? What would you like to do? Well, I imagine I probably haven't seen Mina since the move. So I will probably go by Vince's place and uh, see if I can visit with Mina. Wonderful. Yes, you haven't really met with Mina since the whole events with Lamb and his Sabat pack. You know that she went with Vince to his new location, but you haven't been there yet, and you haven't seen Mina thus in some time, or rather, talked to Mina. Vince is the only one who's ever actually seen her. So, you can definitely give Vince a call. So, Vince, you've finished up with your second patient of the night. You don't have any more scheduled appearances uh, for cleansing. It's fairly... A fairly slow night, and as Aaron is doing the cleanup in the room that he usually does on these sorts of nights, your phone rings, which hasn't happened in quite some time for you. 
First he's surprised and then he sees Alex on the caller ID and Vince is very much like, ah, that explains that. Takes a deep breath, fortifies himself because he knows he's going to get yelled at. Hello? Hi, Vince. Can you ask Mina if she wants some company tonight? I'm out at the moment, but I'll be heading straight home and um, I can send you a text with the with the answer in 10, 20 minutes. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. I'll um yep, I'll let you know soon. Okay. Vince, you get home to your apartment. It's a third floor walk up, which, you know, doesn't bother you too much, but you specifically wanted something higher up for various reasons. You walk up the stairs. It's dark in here. Not that it bothers you too much, but you just have the same kind of feeling of almost emptiness that you've been experiencing most nights now. It's it's not quite ennui. It's not quite fatalism. It's just more... You don't feel connected to reality. It's almost like dissociation and you've had dissociative bouts you know back when you were human you know what it feels like that's kind of the closest word you can think of where the things that you used to enjoy don't give you pleasure anymore and even just coming back home to see Mina doesn't even put a smile on your face you're just existing when you're hungry you feel things but you're not hungry right now so you're just kind of You're a walking corpse. That's the thought that presents itself to you as it has on so many nights over the last couple months. That you get to the top of the stairs and you trudge up to your apartment door and fiddle for your keys. And as you open the door, a book goes flying at your face. At least some things have not changed. It's important to have rocks in your life that you can build as build upon as foundations i think in true form vince isn't even going to try and dodge it he is going to let the book hit him and uh like even if he could he doesn't try picks it up slowly off the ground and he uh brings it back to the table puts it down uh mina um alex was asking if you wanted company would you like them to uh to visit There's a screeching sound as a pencil is dragged across a table and a little bit of a breeze as some paper goes flying before she's able to stabilize one piece of paper on the table. And she writes out a giant Y and then five exclamation points. Vince just takes a photo of that and sends it to Alex. (laughs) Just sends it via text and he's just... uh just sends a follow-up message please come over i will um send him a message back that says i will be there but not for you vince just looks at that and it's just like why would anyone be and he just <laughs> locks the phone puts it down on the desk and um vince is then going to start contemplating blood sorcery and meditating on it and what his understanding of it and how it works. So Vince has a seat on the floor, surrounded by books and papers, and starts rationalizing to himself as he does pretty much every night. Oh, he is trying as best he can, even even if you feel like Vince, it's not going to work. You're, you're still trying for Mina, and so Alex, you get in your in your Lincoln, and Ajax tips his hat to you. And uh, says, uh, home or? We're going to uh, Vince's new place. And I'll give him the address. So will the shaman be there? Oh, no. He's on his boat. He has a boat now. Remember? Uh, We went to the boat. Right. Thank fuck. And Ajax is a little bit looser now that you've ghouled him. He's a a bit more relaxed uh, in your company. And he, he knows where not to cross the line, but he does occasionally make comments, which are probably amusing. And he puts in the address and drives you down towards the docks 
Your car is recognized by the secret sentries around the area. They know you're allowed in and out. And so you're able to get to the apartment building. It's fairly old, looks not completely modernized, probably been around since the early 1900s. Bit rickety, could definitely use with some repair work, but it means it's it's out of the way. People aren't going to be congregating around it and it's not a center of attention. So you get out of the car, Ajax pulls out uh, a book, He's really, really gotten into science fiction lately. So he's just stacking up the books as he goes. And you can head up to the third floor. Will do. And uh, knock on the door. Apartment nine. So there's a knock on the door, Vince. And Alex, you don't hear anything from Mina. But again, it's not her place. She can't invite you in anymore. I find that and really irritating now. So, Vince, you hear the knock. And then a few seconds later, when you haven't immediately stood up to go answer the door, a pencil goes flying at your face and then starts tapping you on the forehead over and over and over. Vince just silently gets up and goes over to the door. Takes off the chain, <laughs> undoes the deadbolt, and just opens it. Steps back in. Just once you enter, uh, Alex. I will uh, enter the apartment and look around for Mina. Now, as you enter the apartment, you see Vince. Although you try not to look at him, he really does look like a corpse, and that's just not that. That's not okay for your delicate senses, and so. There's a, a rush of kind of warm breeze around your hair. It, it's a very kind of welcoming feeling. Ah, uh, happy to see you too, Mina. A spider goes crawling across your shoes. A phantom spider. So Vince, why don't you describe this, what Alex is seeing? This is the first time they've been in your apartment. They've only ever been in your nice, well-equipped bungalow. And this is a very different place. Definitely not as nice as the bungalow was. But um, in an effort to make Mina feel at home, Vince has actually, you know, there's there's some nice bits of furniture around. There's a nice lamp. There's the nice bookshelves. There's <laughs> the same table and two chairs from the library. And, um, you know, that's, that's, it's mostly bookshelves at this point. Called in a few favors from people who he saved. So, well, vampires that he saved. So, you know, he's gotten resources just enough to be comfortable it is a bit spartan in terms of it's not the walls aren't painted the nice warm colors of the bungalow and it's very clearly been decorated by a guy with no sense of anything beyond just functionality you know as i said there is nice furniture but it's not been deployed in places where it can be seeing nicely you know you look up on top of a bookshelf and there's a, a lamp why is it up there yeah he is not he is not being clever about how where he put things he was just like well it won't take up space up there puts it there so i see you have uh taken a step down as far as uh mina's home i figured it was better than uh her being killed again uh, in retaliation for stuff that I did. Just gives you a tight little... <laughs> not even a smile, just his lips crease. Do you want to stay here, Mina? Mina drags a sheet of paper out into the hallway. You just see, like, floating out of the office area <laughs> into the hallway. The front door opens, Vince. <laughs> he just... Grabs and just kind of... Walks out of the co- out of the apartment, like dragging it on the floor beside him. It's just like, yep. Uh, uh, I'll be around, so uh, take your time. Um, just you know, don't uh, don't leave me outside for the sunrise. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll, uh, nice seeing you, Alex. Um, feel free to lock up as you're leaving. I'll. The door slams shut behind you. So, Alex, you're alone with Mina. 
Yeah, I'll um find some less dusty place to sit and uh or dust it off. <laughs> I mean, can't wrinkle the suit. So, yeah, and uh get some paper out and uh yeah, ask Mina, do you want to stay here? A small, well, not small, but rectangular box goes flying off the shelf and you see it's uh, a Ouija board. Oh, okay. If you prefer this, it's a little cliche, but I mean, I guess it works. So I'll just like pick it up and pull it over. The planchette starts moving rapidly a lot faster than she could with writing. It just Mm. is easier. Yeah, makes sense. Veil thick here. Mm. Writing hard. Also makes sense. Of course he wouldn't have, you know, consulted anybody that would know anything about that. But are you staying for him? Is my question. Planchette slowly moves towards yes. And I mean slowly. Okay. And then rapidly it spells out, hate it here. I doubt I can convince him to move. I mean, maybe. He's sick. Well, he's less human, that's why. The soul. Yeah. Also happens when you uh, eat other vampires. I've heard that's not good for you. The planchette just taps yes a few times. Well, I mean, my only concern is you, and I was going to offer you to stay at my place. I know my place is much easier. Plus, then you could hang out with Luther if he's around, if he's not hanging out with the gang girl. But the planchette drops and the paper flies up and you see a little heart drawn on it. Well, it's really up to you. But Vince, the other thing I can do is I can look around and see if there's any places around here that have more room for you. And tell him to move. Maybe. You not like Vince. Now? Question mark? I don't not like him. I just... It's hard. He helped save me. And what he did cost him. I don't know how to help him. Me too. And I don't want to be... Because of the game that I am playing... I cannot have him jeopardize it or be seen being friendly to him, if that makes sense. Yes. Worried. Not himself. The planchette taps the board a few times and then it spells out, hurt me. I notice that. Vince lose... Vince hurt me I know I know your book's not your only fetter and that sucks yes no Karen no more family Markovich Vince last last one yeah we'll have to figure out something I can look into what I can do but I I deal with people and creatures that are already dead So dealing with the living isn't really my thing. Never trust living. Agree. There's a bit of a pause and there's some blood trickling down a wall, phantom blood, which is Mina's way of stalling while she's thinking. Don't like here, but Vince, but don't know. What do you advise? Well... Does it actually harm you to be here, or is it just hard? Just hard. Okay. No, find Kate. Yeah, right. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I will drive around the docks tonight. I will look for a spot that has a thinner veil, and I will make Vince move. Ha. Someone has to. Yeah. And 
if he can. You need to communicate with him to help him, too. Hard. I know. That's why if we get him to move... Eat funny. What do you mean? Window. Human sleep. Eat. Creepy. Yeah. Ew. I thought he did the Capri Sun thing. Not now. Too hard. That isn't gonna... That's not gonna help him. Not drain. At least. But try. Excellent. Want to go to party. You do? Yes. Bored. Oh. No fun. I will look around for her book. Well, I know where parties are going on right now. Hold on. Do I see Mina's book? Yes, her book's on the desk where it normally is. Okay. I will go pick it up and be like, do you want to go to a party? I'll call Vince. Or I'll call Luther, too, see if he's busy. Just that piece of paper with the exclamation points and the large Y just floats in the air in front of you. And there's spiders crawling up and down the wall very quickly. Then, uh, yeah, I will uh, leave the apartment. Where is Vince? Is he just sitting outside his apartment? Like on the curb, like a sad kid? No, Vince knows that he's not allowed to... (laughs) Marcus's rules for moving into the docks where you're not allowed to just sit on the street brings down the neighborhood. But uh, no, Vince has gone for a walk. He's he's toddled off. Oh, okay. Then when I am leaving his apartment and I lock the door and stuff, I have Mina's book. I'm going to call Vince. Seeing a second call from Alex Giovanni in one night. He's just like, I'm going to get shouted at so goddamn hard. Hi, Alex. I just... I don't want you to be alarmed. Mina wants to go to a party. So I have her book. We're going to go to a party with Luther. And you're going to have to move. He just stands there blinking. You'll still be living within the dock area. It's just that the place that you're at now is hard for Mina. It's hard for her to breathe. Oh, I didn't realize. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll get on to Marcus. I'll ask for... I'll ask if he can tell me a place that's... Yeah. um, Is there something I should look for? Uh, Like a history of murders in the house? Or... I'll scope it out. We're going to go look at property here in a little bit before we go to a party. And I will give you a couple of ideas. Oh, okay. Okay. That sounds good. Thanks, Alex. And um, if anything happens to, uh, to me, please take care of Mina. I can't, because if something happens to you, something happens to her. So you need to get your shit together so that she can be better. And he's just like, oh, yeah, well, I'll I'll do my best. No, do not accept your doom as okay. It's, I don't care how you feel about yourself. You have to get better. Do I know how? No, I work with dead people. Have to ask, like, Marcus or somebody. Sure, sure. I, um, look, I'll, uh... Enjoy your party. I'll talk to you later. Please tell me. I hope she has a wonderful time. Okay, I will return the book. She wants to stay with you. Mm Mm-hmm. Whenever she's ready. You know where I am, so... Just hangs up. And so we'll leave you and Mina heading off to the party boat, and we'll come back to you and your party later. So, Monica, you have had your meeting with Baron Voss. You understand... Uh, a bit more maybe about what he's intending to do, how you feel about it. You're a bit unsure, but you know that Katarina is still among the unliving, which is nice. That's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. And you know, you're you know not about to be homeless, so there's that. That's also a good thing. What would you like to do with this evening as you're leaving the docks territory? This meeting on the book with... Baron Voss has been there for a while, so she would have made sure her schedule is completely clear of having to work the shop or work the uh, the EMT. So with a night completely open right now, I think she's going to have to try to blow off some of the steam. So she is going to call Chase from the Bluetooth in her car and then drive over to like 
one of those bougie gyms that's like 24 hour access and she has a car too. She's going to get into a batting cage and just try to process some of this enlightened bullshit that Marcus just dropped on her like 30 minutes ago. So she's going to call Chase on the way to the gym and then she's going to bat some of this stress off, I think is what she's going to go for. Okay, so you put the call through and after a couple rings you hear, how'd it go, darling? I embarrassed myself. You'd be very proud of me. Oh, well, we knew that was going to happen. It's all right. I know. You could have told me about Fort Knox. That was disarming. I thought it would be more fun if you experienced it for yourself. Yeah, I I experienced it and everyone experienced it with me. Thank you so much for that. And she's going to fall out laughing. I do have an honest question for you, though. Are you actually buying into this Disneyland version of kindred society that the Baron is pushing? There's a long pause. Honestly, Monica, I don't know. But I think, I think one, it's our best option. Feel free to disagree. You know, I love our little disagreements. But I think, I think there's a chance. And I think if anyone was going to make it work at at all, it is this point in time. Hmm. With Esme gone the city in disarray from in both the human side and the kindred side. The Primogen Council is half depleted at this point. Mallet has yet to name a successor and the Camarilla seem to be involved in other things, at least back in Chicago. At least there's no, been no reinforcements or anything of that nature. This is the best time for anything like that to work. And if anyone can do it, I think it's the Bruja. We know how good they are at this sort of thing anyway. And then he chuckles and says, besides, have you seen the gangrel running around Golden Gate Park? I I just... I know. Oh, Chase, I just... I just don't know. This seems like putting a lot of eggs in one basket. If Mallet doesn't kill him first... And if that happens, then where does that leave us? And if he doesn't manage to kill him first, I don't know if he's going to be able to... If... Hey, I'll see you closer to morning. I'm at the gym. I'm going to go swing some of this off. Yes, uh, have fun breaking some balls. (laughs) And there's a deep, deep chuckle that you can almost feel in your bones over the phone. Which immediately lights her up from like the six that she was sitting at over to a 13. She's feeling already more like herself, more upbeat. She says, I love you. I'll see you in the morning. I will see you at home. And there's a click as he hangs up. So you get to this swanky gym that you have access to. And they're used to you coming in at all hours of the night. And they know exactly what you're planning to spend your time doing they have one cage that is reserved for you every night because they know they need to be ready if you come in the bats are all prepared and you can go in and start swinging off some aggression okay and that is exactly what she's going to do she's going to uh peel herself out of that huge sweatshirt she was wearing where it's just like the blank the black tank top now along with the leggings. Um, She probably has a locker there that has a a few, you know, spare clothes in it. So she'll get into some comfortable shoes. Uh, She will tape up and then she's just going to start swinging and swinging and swinging. And she's, she's swinging through the embarrassment because she's convinced she embarrassed herself in front of like new leadership. So she's swinging through that. Uh, She's also contemplating whether or not Marcus can actually get this, this Disneyland version of Vampire Society off the ground. Because if he does, what does that mean for her, her sire, and their clan, what's left of us? And then it's just pure aggression because it's also like, if he is the golden ticket out of this misery that we call a kindred society, at least from the perspective of Salubri, if William kills him first, we are fucked. And so she's swinging through all of that. So you start swinging and you're batting out your aggression and your agitation and everything. How did Monica start using this as a processing method? What got her into the baseball bat life? So if we're rolling back time, probably going to be back in Guam during the Japanese occupation of her island, 
when she and her family members were committed to that camp, entertainment was very limited. A stick and a ball was something very easy to keep the children occupied uh, if they weren't being used for other purposes. So that's probably something that she picked up with her siblings while she was there um, as a way to not only entertain each other, but also to kind of distract each other. And it's kept with her all of these decades. I mean, she treats, Monica treats her baseball bat like I treat lip gloss. There's one in the car. There's one in the bathroom. There's one in the bedroom. There's one, you know, anywhere she can get her hands on, uh, that's always going to be near because that helps her think. It helps her process. And also in a weird way, it kind of makes her feel safer. Excellent. So you spend about 30 minutes just hitting these baseballs over and over and over. A couple times you actually hit them with such force that they split in half, which they're used to around here at this point. And so as you pause for a moment, you sort of reflexively still wipe your brow, even though you don't sweat. It's just kind of a reflexive action for you that you've trained yourself to do in case anyone is watching. Yeah. You hear a slow kind of clapping from behind you. If she had hackles, they would be going up at this point because she hates that bullshit. She hates that predatory or that predatory intimidating I've been like she she hates moments like this so she'll just tap the bat twice on the ground and she'll just turn around slowly and she's like dripping with annoyance so you turn around and you see a tall woman with blonde hair and icy blue eyes she's wearing a very neatly tailored suit she's very cold looking standing there on six inch stilettos And she's just watching you. Yes. Very impressive, Miss West. She closes her eyes and pauses because, again, she just... Just off of the smell. This is Kindred, right? This feels like some vampire bullshit. Yeah. Oh, the mind games and the intimidating McFuckery. Like, she absolutely hates it, uh, but she has to tolerate it. And she says, yes. Just thought I'd drop in and say hello. You're so hard to reach alone sometimes and well it's impossible to see chase he's much wilier than you are my name is phoebe van ness do i know that name you know that name that's the tremere whip god damn it the most she's gonna do as far as acknowledgement is just not like i recognize that name don't worry i'm not going to hurt you not here anyway She looks around. There's the humans behind the counter. Too far away to hear, but they're there. There's a few other executives and and late night owls who are at other batting cages and working in the gym. But I just want you to know, you and Chase, things are going to be different in San Francisco now. Very different. And I think We've left you alone for far, far too long in your little haven with your little plants and your oh-so-cuddly relationship with your sire. It's been so good for you the last 40 years. Well, that's different now. And... Let's just say once some order has been reestablished, you won't want to see my face again. And her eyes are cold and hard as ice. She's squirming. She's fidgeting. She can't help it at this point. There's nothing that she can do from a retaliation standpoint right now physically. And even if she attempted it, she wouldn't survive it. Prince Velasquez should never have allowed your kind here. And that is an error I intend to rectify. Your kind are only good for one thing, Miss West. And I'm sure you know what that is. She's going to do her best to get this line out, but she's probably going to choke at the very front of it. Is there anything else, Miss Phoebe? She laughs, but it's a, it's not pleasant. It's this kind of 
cold, hard, almost like a diamond in its sound, like it could break things. For now, Miss West, I would just say be looking over your shoulder once the new prince is announced. I don't think Clan Ventru is going to be as kind to you as the, in her nostrils flare, Nosferatu. I just thought I'd do you the kindred courtesy of a warning first. Besides, we've been waiting for this for a long time. It's so rare to find two of you in the same place. That's the only warning you get. Thank you for taking time out of your, I'm sure, very busy genocidal schedule to come by and offer me a warning. I I sincerely appreciate that. Good luck with the machinations that you have ahead of you. I'm sure that's something that you enjoy very much. If you don't need anything else from me, whip. I'll take my leave. Her eyes tighten slightly around the corners, but she doesn't break that facade of icy, cool calm in any other way that you can see. And she just sort of steps aside and gestures grandly with one hand. Enjoy your night. There won't be many left for you. She will snatch up uh, her her sweater that's on the floor, her keys. Um, She is going to do everything she can not to start crying in this very moment. And then she is going to leave the gym and she has to head right fucking back to Fort Knox. If she can get that far. (laughs) I I think I want a composure roll. Jesus, she hit a 995. 995. Okay, so with two successes, you're holding yourself together. This woman is intimidating. You've stayed away from Tremere as much as you can because you know about your clan's history with the Tremere. Chase has spared you as much of it as possible, but there's some things you can't just avoid. And so you are not going to let her win at this moment. And so you hold yourself together tightly. You just sort of nod your head in the bare minimum of politeness, grit your teeth, and you walk out. Yeah. So did I hear correctly that you are speeding back to Fort Knox? I'm speeding back to Fort Knox, yeah. (laughs) Do you make any calls? Do you call Marcus to tell him you're coming? Do you just show up because you're agitated and you don't think about it? Do you call Chase? What do you do? Hmm. So if I'm playing into the role, she hit two on her composure. So if I'm playing to that, she's rattled. Her hands are probably shaking. Uh, Her nervous system that doesn't exist, but she can still feel and connect with is probably stuck right now in fight or flight. So she will make another quick phone call to Chase, which is just, God bless her. They just spoke 45 minutes ago, but it's very abrupt. It's just, I need you to meet me back at Fort Knox. What's Fort Knox again? Oh, God, Chase, it's the the Bruja's Palace of Iron. And can you please just meet me there? Like now? Well, uh, all right. The barony got it. He hangs up. And then she, Jesus, she will call her new baron. So, Marcus. Yes? Esmeralda comes stomping back into the uh, your office. Not intentionally being rude she just stomps everywhere that's just how she does things and she looks into the the meeting room and crosses her arms over her chest the Russian one said you wanted to see me she's not Russian I uh, sit back just just slightly in the chair and say sit down her nostrils flare a bit because she's still kind of in the headspace of being sheriff And being used to being in charge, but then remember she's not anymore. And she sits down. I trust you to keep things secure. You do a very good job of that, you know? But when we have guests, especially guests that have come with a previous invitation, late or not, I need you to try to not scare the shit out of them. She blinks and then lets out a slight bark of a laugh. I don't know what that means. Not everybody that walks through that door is gangrel or bruja. You're going to have to learn and adapt 
to the changing social cultures here. And maybe that means you have to powder people's behinds a little bit. So be it. It's about being able to work together. And when you have a potential resource in a clan that is mostly unseen in kindred knights, you don't want them running in fear, right? Right. Right. I know the blood doesn't do us any favors in this regard, but the next time she stops in, just try to be a little bit more sociable. Social. She says that word like it's a four-letter word. Sociable. I know you can do it. Fine. I'll try. Thank you. Now, I understand that there is a a party coming to the bay at some point. Are you aware of this? You mean the shaman's Valentine's Day bang and bash? Yes. I was informed that there would be flesh, blood, and fun or something like that was printed on the flyer. I don't know. Kind of gaudy, but yes. Listen, say what you want. Rom throws a great party. Mm. She actually cracks a slight <laughs> smile. It was fun last time. The New Year's one. Not gonna lie. I think we should just be eyes and ears open during this time. We'll have probably visitors visiting the bay. I'll speak with Miriam, but also to our clan. Let's make sure that our people are watching the peers. Can I be open, Marcus? Certainly. I find the presence of such a vessel in our territory a little concerning for security purposes. People going in and out, the creepy dead ones from the temple. I don't know who all of them are. It's hard to keep track of everyone. Someone could slip in and you've got that Tremere in here. There's at least five bounties on his head. Mm -hmm. I'm aware. Someone could slip in and just stake him without anyone noticing during one of these events. It, It worries me. So you'll have to pay closer attention. Yes. I mean, don't, don't, don't come to me with a shopping list of concerns unless you're willing to pay the bill. I need a couple more of us to watch the docks on regular rotation. I need deputies. That's what I want to hear. Remember that we have retired Camarilla titles. Yes, yes. What are we calling it? Co-workers, colleagues. Union brothers and sisters. And those non-gendered? Mm-hmm. Well, I need some of those. I will attend to it. And if we could get a couple day watchers. And she, she pulls a map out of her pocket and she points out a couple places. Anyone could get in here or here during the day and we wouldn't know they were there. These are places that are close to Vince and this one is too close to you. If we move Vince, if we had to move him because of that, there there are only so many people that can watch during the day. Right. So uh, I'll I'll take it under advisement. I'll see if I can find you some day and night help. If you can't find enough to cover that area over by his place move him in closer to you that is my security advisement because as much as I don't like the kid if someone stakes him on your territory that's on me and then I have to go out and hunt down some motherfuckers well yeah because that would be such a terrible thing for you to be able to do she smiles briefly listen nobody likes to lead the life of a um, a target I'm certain it's very difficult for Vince, but in some ways, he dug his own grave in that regard. In other ways, I raise a hand before she can retort. In other ways, he systematically saved the kindred of San Francisco. And so we're going to afford him whatever protections we possibly can. And if we're going to protect him, he needs to be away from that this area here. It's too close to the docks. You can have someone coming in by water. You can have someone coming in here by land. I wouldn't put it past Mallet to send in a couple human ghouls and stake him so that Mallet or someone someone can come in and just spirit him away. 
We'll make a change. Okay. I'll try to be more sociable. You will. It's an adjustment. It is. And if there were partygoers that weren't supposed to be in the domain, of course you'd have the first right to deal with them as you see fit. I'm certain that Miriam and some of her, we'll say aquatic gangrel clan members could certainly assist you. She licks her lips. Mm, That would be fun. There are some perks to this job. There are. So she stands up. She nods. Esmeralda is not someone who ever makes apologies verbally, but the kind of slight tilt to her head is enough for her. Okay. I am going to go track down Jean. Yes, we'll get to your phone call from Monica in a split second. But first, Katarina, what did you do after taking Monica to the door? What are your plans now? I mean, realistically, probably if there are no like further plans with Marcus, probably I'm not doing anything else tonight. So you're going to continue to take Ray Ray's advice. And relax, yes. So you go back to your room, which has the little office attached to it where you work and also just some comfortable chairs. You've got a stack of books and you do have a text message on your Nokia. Brilliant. What's it say? It just says, missing you. Hope it's okay. Smiley face from Ray Ray. Oh, and I will text back. I know you're doing a good job. I love you. Proposing to Raul soon. About time. And then just another smiley face, which your phone being a a Nokia T9 just comes in as an emoticon and not an emoji. So it's just (laughs) a colon and a uh, half parenthesis. I understand that. That makes sense to me. Yes, that makes sense to you. So with a little bit of a pang, close your flip phone and put it away. Ray Ray texts you occasionally. This is the first time you've heard from him in a couple weeks, but it it still hurts when he texts you. Yeah, it's okay. It'll be all right. That's what I have to regularly tell myself that I didn't make mistakes and uh, cut, cut and run. Katarina sits down to read her book. Takes you a few minutes, perhaps, to focus, but. You know that things are going to be changing around here with the salubri coming in, what you've heard about what's going on with Mallet and everything else. You haven't seen Vince since Christmas, but you'll be meeting up soon, probably tomorrow night to set things up once your orders arrive to set up your new farm. But for now, you're going to allow yourself, as you promised your friend, a night to relax. So... Marcus, as you head down the hallway to find Jean, who is probably in her office doing paperwork, you get another phone call. You are a very popular man tonight, Baron. Grand Central Station? Uh, that's also going to throw Monica off as she kind of like stammers for a second. She, uh, what? Um, are you still at Fort Knox? Um, I look at the phone really quick. Just to look at the number, because obviously it's probably not a number I've been called before. And then I'm going to skip back in my memory, probably be able to remember a voice from earlier tonight and say, uh, yes. You still swing in that open door policy? Of course. Is is there a problem? Yes. Chase and I are going to be there within the hour. All right. I'll make preparations for it. Thank you. Come as soon as you can. I am. I hang up the phone. (laughs) She'll disconnect on her end on the phone, too. I turn to Jean, who I'm likely already walking towards. Yes, she looks up when she hears you on the phone. Uh, And I say, Harold? Yes, Baron? I smile. She has a slight sarcastic smile. We have two very new additions that are coming in in an hour. There seems to be some issue But Monica and Chase are joining us, and so I would like to make preparations for them. All right. I've already started setting up a house uh, after you met with Chase the first time she hands you some some documents. 
Uh, so separate house, little on the small side, probably for a man like Chase, but well, you know, you got to take what you can get. And uh, it's right close to uh, our building. And by our, she means the La Sombra, who have all shacked up in one building. Chateau La Sombra. Yes, Chateau La Sombra. And we can keep an eye on them over there. It's pretty close. Shouldn't be easy to get to. Uh, I would like to know, once they arrive, what exactly is sending them running full tilt in here just an hour after the meeting, because that would help me set things up with Esmeralda. Certainly. Yeah, we'll uh, have to find out exactly what it is the source of the trouble is. Um, But that said, we also need to look at potentially moving Vince. There's some security concerns as far as where he's staying at right now. I don't know that we have the daytime security to continue to support him in that area. Well, all the sneaking around he does when he needs to eat, which you're well aware of by now, isn't exactly helpful. So he did slip out a couple weeks ago at some point and he left the territory. Esmeralda was pissed. He hasn't left since, though, but it would be helpful to have him somewhere we can keep a closer eye on him, because I personally would not like to see him lose his head yet. I look her in the eye when she says yet, and I probably get a little oddly um, annoyed at the idea of that word yet. Not that I want him to. It's just extremely likely, considering how many people want to kill him. I'm doing my best. We all are. Let's move Vince a little closer in. And when you determine an address for him, I'd like it first. I'll have to stop by and pay him a welcome home visit, especially just to remind him about some of the rules. You got it. Uh, How quickly do you want me to move him? Oh, I think as soon as possible. All right. I think I can have him in a new place by tomorrow night. Not tonight. It'll take too much there's too much Moving going on. of pieces, yes. And we still have our uh, thing tonight at Chateau La Sombra. I smirk. Yes, uh, you did say that there was um, something a little bit more involved that needed to happen. Mm, we know how to have fun. Let's just put it that way. Still planning to drop by? Absolutely. All right. Well, I'll go down to the house we set up for Chase and Monica then I'll get that set up and I'll be waiting there for them if you want to send them in my direction and she gives you the address on a piece of paper they need to keep it out of their phones if they have phones no putting it to GPS I printed out MapQuest that's still a thing did you know that? it's still a fucking thing I had no idea she laughs (laughs) okay give her a, a quick nod and then I am going to inform the security staff that we will have a couple of new visitors coming and that they will be coming in expeditiously. And so that way they don't get spooked when they arrive. Wonderful. So you make all of those arrangements. Jean sets off in her not super flashy, but very unobtrusive silvery smoke colored car and heads off for the address she gave you. So while all of these preparations are being made, Rom, a very familiar Lincoln pulls up to the dock outside your boat as you are standing on the deck talking to Preethi. Oh, we're doing more than talking. We're organizing. A very familiar Lincoln pulls up with a very familiar figure in a peaked uh, driver's cap sitting in the front seat and very determinedly not making eye contact with you. Oh shit, it's Alex. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Just here in time for my shipment. Absolutely fantastic. All right, I'm going to race down that gangplank. Clickety-clack, clickety-clack. Oh my god. How is Rom dressing these days? Now that he's a child of Michael? I imagine... Um, I've kind of moved up a little bit. Maybe some Banana Republic. I think Banana Republic's probably the best way to go here. Yeah. Rom is going to be wearing, in this case, khaki pants today. Now, they're cuffed like two or three times. Um, and I still have my fantastic flip-flops 
on. And then on top, uh, we're going to do a little bit of an Ace Ventura thing here. So we're going to do that uh, white uh, tank top and then a Hawaiian shirt completely unbuttoned and flapping in the wind with a puka shell necklace. So Alex, as you get out of the car and look up at Rom, who is waving over the edge of the boat at you, perhaps the first thought that crosses your mind is you have got to teach him how to dress at this point. Uh, Rom, you see Alex carrying a leather-bound book under their arm. Are you planning on doing some light reading tonight? No, I have a guest. You have a guest. Oh, is it a spooky book? Sh- sure. So where's the Where's the guest? Is it Is the book the guest? Is what's How's this working? She wanted to come to a party. It's Mina. Haven't you met Mina? I've met Mina, but so she's mobile. Well, they all are. I I don't know how these things work. That's fine. It's just, I know, I just, I have, there's a shipment of uh, items coming in today for Marcus, so I have to make sure that everything goes well. But you, of course, have full use of your own room on Le Chateau de Boat. Well, I was just wondering if you had a party or anything going on. Uh, Yes, a working party, um, to be honest with you. We do have that big bash coming up on the 14th. Um, Did they have Valentine's Day when you were a kid? Like, all the way back then? It's like, how how old is Valentine's Day? Fairly old, depending where you lived. And, I mean, St. Valentine was around for a while. Was that the one with the snakes? Also depends on where you live and what... (laughs) What you were brought up believing. Okay. Fantastic. I mean, well, here, come on board. I'm sure that we can, I mean, I'm sure there's something going on on any given night. You can't really have a, you know, a working party without some brewskis. So there's definitely, you know, uh, plenty of my people around um, and probably some lively music or something like that. Did you hear about who we booked? No. Okay, I'll tell you about it later. They're absolutely fantastic. Totally metal. Anyways, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn like to because I'm I'm just assuming that Mina's like standing next to me and I'm gonna pull out like my phone to like the keyboard and ask, uh, do you want to stick around for this or do you want me to find something else? Is Shaman? Hi, Rom. Mina says hi. I thought we weren't supposed to... Uh, who are you texting? Is this... Wait, hold on. Is this... Is this the Is this the ghost? The ghost is texting. Mina is texting. Mina yes. is texting. Hi, Mina. Hello. I'm... I have no idea where to point my eyes. Can see boat? She types. No boat for century. Oh, yeah. We can go take a tour. Oh, yeah. Boats have air conditioning now. It's actually fantastic. Um, and yeah, come on up. Let's go on board. You can feel, Alex, just the the air around you where Mina must be hovering is just... She feels excited. Not just the, the normal kind of tense, grumpy old lady she normally acts like when, when you've talked to her. She seems to be genuinely excited to be out here. Excellent. So I'll just take her on a tour of the boat. Absolutely. There's there's definitely always something going on down in the galley. There is, uh, I imagine right now, there's probably celebrating somebody's birthday uh, down there. Uh, probably old cake um, that's, that's, that's out on the counter. And just a bunch of cheap champagne. The cheapest of champagnes. We're talking about that stuff they only break out around New Year's that just says brut on the front. So, you know, the less muscular of the crew who would be, you know, bringing things on board the ship, the less muscular ones would probably be down here entertaining themselves. So I imagine no Eric down here. Okay, so Rom can give Mina and Alex a tour of the party boat 
And Mina seems to be genuinely excited. Although, Rom, you do see occasional uh, spiders scuttling along the walls. Mm. And any room she wants to go into, all of there's this like this spectral blood that starts trickling down the door. So, oh, oh, God. She has, she seems to have a very fun time, though. She can do the blood thing here. That's, that's devastating. All right. Fantastic. I make sure to show her like where I stay and how I have it decked out and how many suits I have and... Oh yes, you have your own suite here. With at least 50 suits. At least. I mean, you gotta have a color for every occasion and then I gotta have the shoes that match and then I gotta have the ascot that goes with it. Yeah. It's very well laid out. Your room is the only one right now that's not full of cardboard boxes. We have been taking on uh, a bunch of and and Romp kind of leans into Alex a little bit. We've been uh, we've been taking on a bunch of uh, communications equipment recently. Oh right, yeah, we talked about that. Yes, so I'm going to have to ask Marcus to please remove it from my spaces soon, hopefully via the installation of it because it is taking up all of the what do they call these p ways and ladder backs and stairwells all over this place oh that reminds me i have to call marcus oh well um is so is mina like attached to the phone or the book or both of them do you just you're like i could we could can you continue that way if I take the phone, then you won't be able to call Marcus. Mina, do you want to go with him or do you want to wait here with me while I call Marcus? Explore. You want to explore? Okay. How do you have enough range if I keep everything safe here? I think so. Place fetter open. Right. Okay. Fantastic. So I'm just going to walk the halls, I guess, then, and I'm going to talk to the air, and I'm going to operate within the assumption that Mina is listening. Yeah, okay, we're going to go check out the deep freeze, because you've got to see the size of the reefers on the ship. They are absolutely amazing. We can store so much stuff. You see a scrawl of blood on the wall that says bodies, question mark? Absolutely. Bodies are one of the things, although I am trying to work out a deal with the local aquatic gangrel for body disposal, but I don't know if that's going to go anywhere. There's a light ruffling of your hair, like a breeze passed through it, and it, it feels kind of condescending, honestly. Oh shit, you can touch people. That's, that's horrific. Oh god. Okay, let's go. So... Alex is making a phone call to Marcus and Rom is giving Ghost Mina a tour, a very uneasy tour of the ship. So meanwhile, a very fancy Lamborghini has pulled up outside your haven, Marcus, followed very shortly by Monica's car. And Chase steps out of it just as as Monica pulls in. He's wearing a a very nice suit like he was the last time. And uh, he looks very well put together, but he's got a slight expression of concern on his face as Monica comes roaring up in a panic. Okay. Hmm. So we probably would have them uh, park inside. That way it's, uh, it's nice and safe and we can shut the door. The garage overheads. So you, you'd pull into this very long pier building that sits uh, that at the other other end of it would be uh, the open space would lead into the bay. But the inside here has all been redone. And the, the n- n- normally in these long pier buildings, there are tiny shops and little businesses and stuff like that. Now that's all been cleared out. And uh, it's been retrofitted to be, we'll just say, kindred friendly. But yeah, I meet Chase and extend it. A hand in greeting. He takes your hand. He's very well manicured. Very obviously hasn't done a day of work in his life, or rather a night of work in his unlife. Not with his hands, anyway. And he 
smiles slightly and says, uh, thank you, Baron. Uh, any idea what this is about? You know, honestly, I don't know. Uh, your child had said that there was a issue and that uh, she needed to make use of the barony and its domain uh, in a rather more immediate sense. So i um, happy to happy to help and happy to learn more about what uh, what's caused such a, um, a change. He just sort of shakes his head. I don't know. She called me in a panic, which is, I mean, par for the course with Monica, but more panic than usual. I do not react. I don't react to him saying that. And as as he says that, Monica's car comes rolling in. I tried to get run over. Yeah, because she's coming in super hot. Uh, it's one of those things where she does remember to put the car into park. But she does not remember to turn it off as she is like jumping out of the vehicle and ripping that headdress off of her her forehead. And she looks at you, Marcus, with like these broken, frantic eyes. And she looks at her sire with just pure heartbreak. And she says that repugnant, hateful, hatchet face bitch cornered me at the gym. She knows where we live. She knows where she lived, where we live. She knows where we work. She knows the nature of our relationship. She knows about our ghouls. She knows everything. She's playing with her meat and she's waiting for the, the regime to exchange hands so she can move on us. We need to make a decision right now. We're either siding with him, almost as if Marcus isn't in the room, or we need to leave. And look at Chase. He just holds up a hand and says, uh, Monica, darling. Remember what we said about even not needing to breathe, take a metaphysical breath. You weren't there, Chase. She knows about us. She knows about our ghouls. She knows where we live. She knows where we work. And she's waiting. I don't know why she's toying with her food. That fucking Kindred and fucking Tremere. She's a cat, Monica. Well, she cornered me, Chase. She cornered me and I was alone and I didn't have any defenses. He, he puts both hands on your shoulders and just sort of starts gently rubbing your shoulders. Just like, calm down. It's all right. Now, why don't you explain to the Baron here what's going on in measured sentences? You can do this. Baron Voss, what protections can you offer us? And what is the exchange rate on extending such protections? <laughs> okay. So we work a little differently here. If you're expecting some sort of long and drawn out trade, that's really not the way things work. So you've come here and you're asking for help. And so when you say help, I'm going to give it to you. That's just sort of the way things work. What I can offer you is physical protection, certainly. Your likely flippant Fort Knox comment is one thing, but there are some realities, right? Uh, beyond that, Clan Gangrel and Clan Bruja here in the city and in the bridge beyond in Oakland stand with the barony, the domain itself. As far as what we can offer you, I can offer you all sorts of potential things, one of which would be housing within the domain, provided that you're willing to agree to, you and your sire, agree to very three very simple rules. I, I sort of turn to Chase and say, these are the same ones I'd mentioned in, in, in our meeting one that we, we protect the masquerade because it does everyone the same amount of protection. It is not a Camarilla law. It is a law of kindred. That you, while living within the domain, agree to respect the rights that others within the domain have and that you do not pray in their areas. A simple understanding that when you need to feed, you do so quietly. And then lastly, that you agree to guard that same domain as you would your your own that your brothers sisters and others are your own you offer them the same services anyone within living the domain who may come to you and ask for assistance that you give it without hooks and strings because it's those hooks and strings that have spoiled our society Chase nods as we agreed. She does not. I've already asked um, Jean to see to finding you a, a place to live. One that is relatively close to my own holdings. One that might not be as large as you're used to, but 
one that is well protected and you might be you might you might need to find a um, additional garage space I don't we don't get many Lambos down here but that said that should be about it well that's agreeable to myself and I'm sure to Monica we will get uh, set up I suppose we'll need to make some arrangements for bringing things here but as for Miss Venice I understand her background and her clan is a potential issue I understand how close she has become to the Prince Regent and how she likely eyes a potential seat at the head of the table when he decides to leave we do not accept Nazis. Both of his eyebrows go up. And she blanches. If she could, she would. That is what Miss Van Ness is. Doesn't surprise me. Nor I. Wouldn't think they'd be here and so blatant about it. Well, I have no love for the fascist scum either, and neither does Monica. And he just kind of puts a protective arm around you. Monica, just holding you very close. And you'll notice this, Marcus just how close they are. Yeah. Yeah. Cause she'll grab his other hand and start intertwining her fingers around them. That'll eventually come up like directly. Under, Cause typically they wouldn't flaunt, but like she's vulnerable right now. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I probably don't pay it any, any mind. It wouldn't be the first sire and child that I have seen in my lifetime be loving. Close. Close. Right. They're just close. That, that happens. So yeah, I, I suppose I will have um, Jean forward the address to you. There is one request that we make, and that is that the address that we give you not be entered in into any any um, GPS that you have. Nothing on their car, nothing on your phone. Learn where you live and learn the space where you're going to exist without utilizing technology to do so. We as we as kindred must remember that it, the when the second Inquisition came. They came via technology. Chase nods, uh, of course. Uh, come on, Monica, we should not take up any more of the Baron's time. He looks a little anxious for the first time. This is the first time, Marcus, you've seen that kind of cool facade of his break, even a little bit. I uh, I try to hold Chase just a moment, just momentary with a, with a physical action. Like I, I reach out towards him with, with my left hand rather than my right, and I, I place a hand on his forearm and just say, it's just Marcus. The title is appreciated, but it is unnecessary. He raises a full eyebrow, as you wish. Come along, uh, Monica. And he nods to you, Marcus, and he leads Monica out to the car. And the two of you will drive off in your separate vehicles to the address you were given, with very <laughs> clear written directions printed from MapQuest. And so you will head off to the house. It is a nice one-story house. It's nothing super fancy like you're used to, but there is a garden on the side. It does look fairly nice. And more importantly, it's outside of Tremere territory. So we'll let you get set up there. And Marcus, as they drive off, your phone rings again. I pick it up. I just answer yes. So I have two matters of business. One is Vince needs to move. Is he too close to you? No. Uh, it's it's hard for Mina huh. to live there. Hmm. Mina and I are going to drive around before it gets too late slash early and find places that would be easier for her if that's okay. Are you, are you requesting to travel through the barony? I chuckle. Oh, not for me. I'm just asking before I tell Vince that he has to move, that you're behind me. Because if anybody's going to help save Vince, it's going to be her. I uh, see no flaw in your logic. I have no problem with you traveling through the uh, barony or her and looking for places which are, I guess, the proper for a spirit of her to, to stay at, to rest at? Yeah, we have, basically we have to find a place that's easier for her to cross lands. 
Okay. So, like, from the land of the dead to the land of the living, I guess is the best way to put it. All right. Yeah, that seems fine. And then the other thing, we may want to speak in person. Really? We did discuss how dangerous that might be. Yeah. But I also don't think that it's appropriate on the phone. That's, you're probably right. So, you might have to check on the boat. What's wrong with the boat? Just come to the boat. I have a party to get to later, but I will make the boat uh, a, a priority. Okay. But it's important. Yeah, I'll stop out when I can. Okay. So you hang up. It's just nonstop work for you now. But first, you've you've got a party to attend, Marcus. Now that now that uh, the other that your two new uh, members of your barony have been sent off, you have a, a chateau de la Sombra to pay a visit to. Indeed, indeed, uh, it's. It was curious seeing them all sort of home up together, but that does sort of blanket that apartment complex pretty perfectly. So you head off to the uh, La Sombra party house, as Jean has referred to it on several occasions. There's a lot of partying in in this barony, apparently. But it is one apartment building that only the 12 of them live in. There are no humans here other than their ghouls who have a couple apartments in the back, but no other humans live here. No other vampires live here. There's this sort of air of danger and darkness around it for Mm -hmm. anyone who doesn't know who lives there. They just sort of feel the urge to move away from it pretty quickly for some unknown reason. But you're aware. You know what to do. And so you go up to the the main door and Jean's already waiting for you. She's taken off her blazer. She's put her, put a bunch of piercings in her face. They heal over when she wakes up, but she re-pierces them most nights when she has a party. And she laughs and says, got the new kids all settled in? So, I'm off the clock. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll take a look around. Mm-hmm. It's, as she leads you in, all the doors are open on this bottom floor. The La Sombra prefer the bottom floor. And there's loud music, mostly heavy metal. There's some opera metal playing in another back room. There's all, heavy curtains, velvet over all of the windows. And there's some heady smoke in the air. There's some incense and what smells like probably the ghouls are smoking weed upstairs. But it's a very convivial atmosphere. Excellent. And Jean leads you into the far back left apartment, apartment six. And all of the normal setup for an apartment has been moved out of here. All the appliances that have been disconnected other than the refrigerator and, you know, washing machine and dryer in the back corner because you need those when you're a vampire. But there's no stove or anything else. And there's just couches everywhere. And there's uh, incense wafting up from the center, very low mood lighting. And there's six or seven vampires just kind of lounging around playing with cats. There are a good 10 to 12 cats in this room. Hmm. And they all look up at you as you enter the cats and the Sombra. Well, that's not creepy at all. Definitely not. Hi, Marcus. A couple of them say. Good evening. So formal. Relax. Well, it's been a busy night. That might be, but we don't allow business into this room. We release ourselves. <laughs> you can't carry a load of business into the abyss, Marcus. Fair enough. You take my coat off. That's already better. And Andrea, the young Lissombra who was talking to you, comes up, takes your coat, and just kind of casually drapes it over a coat rack. All the other coats seem to be just sort of strewn on the floor around <laughs> it as if they'd thrown the coats at the coat rack and none of them actually caught 
but she actually hangs yours up. That's nice. And Jean points to a very comfortable looking plush chair and says, have a seat. I sit down. So they all sit down in various chairs, making a sort of very oddly shaped circle. The shadows are flickering on the walls all around the room, and some of them are moving in ways that were not cast by the candles and the dim light. A cat is meowing in a corner at what looks suspiciously like a shadowy tentacle, which is just waving back and forth. Well, here we are then. Thank you for gracing our home with your presence. Oh, I'm happy to come see Clan La Sombra and happy to get a chance to get to this meeting finally. Right, Jean? Mm, yes. It has been a couple months in the making, hasn't it? But you upheld your side of the bargain and now I uphold mine. I smile. So show us this abyss. And you hear what sounds like the rushing of wind. And you're aware of these other La Sombra coming in. All 12 of them are now in the room. They're all in this sort of circle with half of them standing and the other half of them sitting. And they're, they all close eyes and just sort of hold out their hands up, not holding hands together like in a seance or, or anything of that sort. They're just holding their hands up and Jean starts whispering something. You can't quite catch what it is, but it begins to ripple around the room and she reaches out towards the shadows on the walls and it almost looks to you Marcus as if she's reaching into the shadow and pulling it out of the wall and there's this massive floating ball of shadow in her hands just pulled away from the wall and she looks at it and she throws back her shoulders slightly and she holds it up and you see the sort of shadow writhing around her and you can see her eyes turning an inky black and all the shadows around the room begin to move. You'll have to learn this first, Baron. And she smiles, and the depths of the shadowy ink in her eyes flicker as if there's a light in the void. You must learn to pierce the veil. Are you ready? Absolutely. And she smiles, and they all smile, revealing these very, very sharp teeth. And their eyes all turn black as they pull the shadows into themselves leaving stains, shadowy stains on the walls for the moment. And they're all looking at you as you're sitting almost in, in the circle, at the head of the circle, if it could be called a head. And they're all reaching out to you with the shadows writhing, and they're filling the room, hovering above these candles that are set on all of these tables. And... I am going to need from you a wits plus a cult roll Ooh. as these shadows are writhing. That is two. Okay. So you reach out to the shadows. You feel your hands almost extending out towards them as they slither. It's the only word you can think of as you're looking at this pool of shadows. They are slithering around the room. And you can feel the coldness of the dark writhing around your body as these shadows just sort of curl around you. And as these shadows grow, you can feel the cold beginning in your chest. It's not the same kind of cold you're used to, the cold of death and being undead. It's 
kind of darkness as the dark and the shadows spread out around you. And your mind begins to open into the abyss. And you just see this roiling, writhing mass of waves and tentacles made of shadow. Here one moment, gone the next. There and not there. It's an empty darkness, but it's full of emptiness. It's the only way your mind can think to describe it. But you can feel your eyes beginning to adjust as you stare deeply into these shadows. And you can feel things beginning to solidify around you, almost as if seeing them makes them real. And you hear the voices of these other vampires, Clan La Sombra, all around you. And they're whispering and chanting, and then you hear meowing of some of these cats. And you swear you see these little feline shapes running around in the shadows get louder and louder. And your eyes go wide, and you can suddenly see the room that you were seated, seated in before. But it's it's dark. And you realize the lights are out. The candles have been extinguished. But you can see. And so now you are able to see past the veil, the light within the shadows. You can always see at night in the darkness, no matter how dark it is. But your eyes will always turn pitch shadowy black, as they are now. And you can see the Lysombra all looking up at you. And you can feel the shadows writhing around your ankles and crawling up your spine but in a more comforting way than when you entered the room. And one of the cats come and nuzzles up against your ankle. Black cat that stares up at you with its inky eyes. And Jean lowers her hands and the shadows don't go away. You can still see them slithering around the room. She says, that's the start. There will be more to come. And that is where we will end tonight's episode. Thank you all for joining us and for listening in on the adventures and misadventures of our coterie. We hope you will tune in next time. And in the meantime, if you would like some more content, then you can check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash the old ways podcast, where you can find many, many episodes of our coterie's side quests and adventures into various strange things happening around San Francisco and also just show us some support. Thank you all for your listening ears, and we will see you all next time. Thank you, and good night. Mm-hmm.